We're just waiting for the streaming to start. Mm. Good morning, everyone. Uh, today we will talk about the relationship between structure and dynamics using a, a common model, which is from the networks. And this can be seen as generalizations of, of solar automata. Now, now you will see why, but let me share my slides. I can find them. Can you see the slides? Yes. Okay. So, but the, there's more, more details about this in a, in a paper. I'll, uh, I'll share the reference at the end. So we'll review a bit about self-organization and then what will, what is self, uh, sorry, what are random Boolean networks? And then uh, what is self-organization in random Boolean networks? Then how can we guide the self-organization? Um, so the, I mean, we already mentioned that self-organization uh, can be described in, in many systems um, in the sense that, no, Sorry, we didn't see this yet. Uh, so we mentioned that most systems can be described as complex depending on the perspective of the observer. And actually, um, Ashby, um, he has a paper from, from the 60s, if I'm not mistaken, where, where he says, well, um, if you have a dynamical system, then there will be some states that are more probable than others which we call attractors. And if we decide to call these attractors organized, then the system will self-organize simply because the dynamics tends to the most probable states. So with that in mind, we could say that almost all systems are self-organizing. So the, the question is not so much whether a system is self-organizing or not, but um, when it's useful to, to describe a system as self-organizing. and. Um, we already gave some hints about this. Uh, if we are interested about the relationship of multiple scales, basically how the behavior and interactions of components are related to the global system properties and how the system properties and constraints uh, limit or promote behavior in the individuals, then it makes sense to speak about self-organization because it gives us a fork to study precisely these multi-scale relationships, um, which we can also call uh, emergent or, or not. Um, sorry. So we could say that um, Self-organization is found when we have a global pattern from local interactions, and there are plenty of examples, uh, flocks of birds. Um, we could also say that many examples that, that we, um, we can give also of complex systems, they can be also seen as self-organizing systems. So uh, in, in a cell, molecules uh, self-organize to produce life, in a brain neurons self-organize to cognition, in a colony insect self-organize to perform different collective tasks, in, um, in animals, uh, their group behavior can be said to be emergent, in a market, agents interact to define prices, in traffic, you can say that the product of the interactions of the vehicles in an ecosystem, it's the interaction of species. Uh, in, a, in a society, you can describe many process, social processes as self-organization. 
language, culture, fashion, aesthetics, ethics, politics, and so on, because this can be said to be a result of interactions between individuals, not necessarily all individuals and not necessarily all interactions are the same, but it, it, it's a useful framework uh, to, to describe all, all of these phenomena. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, re repeating what, what I said, uh, almost any system can be described as self-organizing, <clears throat> and not only that, but also as self-disorganized. Uh, in, in this 2003 paper with Francis Kelligan, we, we give an example of a system that depending on how you do the coarse graining of the variables, uh, the same system can be said to be self-organizing or self-disorganizing in the sense that in one case entropy increases and in another entropy decreases, but it's the same system, it's just how you uh, divide this, the space of, or the, the state space. Yeah. But anyway, no, no need to enter into that philosophical discussion, which is interesting, but being pragmatic, uh, it's useful to describe systems of self organizing Again, when we have properties that are more, more than one, one scale, well, we are interested in these properties. Uh, also, we, we want to know about adaptation and robustness, and also for uh, undefined non-stationary spaces. So uh, self-organization can be seen as a, a useful approach to deal with complexity, because precisely, if you remember, complexity is characterized by relevant interactions that produce novel information, and this novel information leads to non-stationary problems. So self-organization can be seen as a way of addressing uh, non-stationarity because uh, it will give you at the same time adaptation and robustness, and we will see uh, a bit more what we mean by that. So uh, guided self-organization could sound as like a oxymoron because uh, one might assume that self-organization is kind of independent and if you try to guide it from a it sounds like a top-down perspective so but it's not like completely opposite it's try, uh, rather trying to reach a balance which in a sense it's similar to what cybernetics uh, was trying to do not necessarily tell systems what to do in control, but to steer them towards desired regions of the state space. Um, so in, in, in this sense, we can also say that uh, guided self-organization is the, the steering of self-organizing dynamics of a system towards the desired configuration, following the cybernetic tradition. Um, and we can see that guided self-organization is useful to understand how natural systems achieve self-organization on the one hand, but also for building artificial systems capable of self-organization. So uh, now we'll see how we can guide self-organization of, of random Boolean networks to, and also how could evolution guide the self-organization of genetic regulatory networks. So random Boolean networks are both of genetic regulatory networks. So uh, what we will mention about this abstract mathematical models in principle could be applied also to genetic regulatory networks. And uh, well, the, there have been already 10 workshops and conferences on guided self-organization. The next one, we're organizing it for next December in New Zealand. Uh, so of course, if the borders are open by then, but um, it's, uh relatively recent field field of research got self-organization so um as i mentioned rbns originally were proposed by kaufman in 69 as models of genetic regulatory networks so in, in 69 it was like way before the human genome project um so the, uh, a bit of a timeline of of genetics uh schrodinger in the uh, Ford published uh, What is Life, and there he um, he proposed that the molecule that carries hereditary information should be something like a quasi-crystal. Um, 
meaning that it couldn't be completely regular because then you cannot encode much information and it couldn't be like just noise because then it's very fragile to for transmission. Um, so so the the first description of, of the DNA was so already in the, in the 1950s and in the early 60s uh, Jacques Monod and um, uh, published um, his essay which in English is the Ch chance and necessity le hazard de la necessité and um, there he also speaks about a balance between randomness, chance, and necessity, what we would call now order, uh, balance between order and chaos. And we'll see that these concepts have permeated to our day. And um, Kaufman was inspired by, by Mono. Uh, so in in 69, he, he borrowed uh, one of the computers at MIT, I think from Marvin Minsky and made some simulations of, of this model that that we'll see. And uh, even when, I mean, there was the idea of genes switching on and off other genes, let's say that there are genetic regulator networks, uh, there was very limited information of what relations were these, uh, what kind of relations and what was the type of, of, of these genetic regulatory networks. So, uh, well, just just a refreshing re refreshment of of genetics 101 uh genes encodes uh proteins through rna so dna uh, translates into rna and the rna translates into proteins and then these proteins have functions and then some of these proteins can activate or deactivate uh pieces of dna or rna so then you can you can say that there, there are some genes that switch on proteins that switch off other genes, but you can simplify this and just say that genes switch on and off uh, each other. Uh, and how they affect, so th there might be one gene that uh, codifies for one protein and then this protein uh, promotes the production of another protein. So that would be like a positive interaction or it could inhibit the production of another protein and that uh, uh, inhibitory or negative interaction. And uh, um, like this, you, let's say people have been building genetic regulatory networks. And uh, I mean, it's still much to do, but now we have uh, real data from several different organisms from different kingdoms. Uh, but b back in 69, we, we have any of that. So you so can uh, use what is known as the ensemble approach. So, so he said, well, we don't know anything about the structure of genetic regulatory networks. So let's just explore different uh, families or classes of random networks. So we generate it randomly. And then we will study what are the properties of networks with few connections or with lots of connections, with few nodes, with lots of nodes, with this type of functions or with any type of function. Uh, and see what are the properties of these classes of networks, these ensembles of networks. Uh, and then let's see what we can say about genetic regulatory networks. And it turns out that you can say a lot about them. Uh, and we'll, we'll see what, what this is. Um, so yeah, this ensemble approach is useful when the specific topology and functions are unknown or cannot be defined, which was the case in 69. Uh, and this gives us the possibility of exploring the, let's say, the, the space where living systems and computational systems are viable. Uh, because, let's say, artificial life was uh, coined on only in the 1980s. But in a sense, this model would also fit the definition that we are exploring life not as it is. So we don't have the data of the real gen genetic regulatory networks. We were exploring life as it could be. So, okay, what would be the requirements of something like a living system? So we will explore huge state space, parameter spaces, and then we'll see where, uh, where in which areas uh, life and computation is viable. 
Um, so th this can be seen as generalizations of Boolean zero automata. It says that, uh, well, let, let me uh, describe what is the model and then it will be easier to, to say, well, uh, was it generalization of, of Boolean zero automata? So in, in a random Boolean network, also known as NK models or Kaplan models, because you have N Boolean nodes linked by K connections each or uh, on, on average. Or, so um, let's say in server automata, you have N cells and you have one function, but it's the same function for all, uh, for all cells, for all nodes. And in these networks, each node has a different function. And also in server automata, the uh, imps for each node are its neighbors. And here they're chosen randomly. So um, first to, to you, you generate the random network. Uh, let's say you decide what will be the average number of connections each node will have. And then with a certain algorithm, you, you decide, okay. Uh, so, so for example, here node O has as inputs N and P. Um, P has as inputs uh, what Q and uh, N and like that. So you can see that some nodes, uh, well, in, in this case, all nodes have two inputs and some nodes like O is not an output, uh, sorry, it doesn't have output, so it doesn't affect any nodes. But then there are other nodes like N which affect several other nodes, like in this case, it affects four other nodes. Um, and, and there are many different flavors. So you try to balance it or make it more uh, skewed so that few nodes have lots of connections and more uh, most nodes have few connections and see what are the differences. Uh, and also the functionality is given by lookup tables. So um, this is a lookup table of two inputs. So uh, uh, let's say if we focus on the lookup table of this node O, Install possible combinations of the inputs N and P, and then you generate randomly the value. In this case, it's an what was this? It's an X nor. Um, so for two inputs, you have uh, sorry for K inputs, you have two to the two to the K possible uh, functions, lo logic functions, uh, and the dynamics. In this case, the initial state on the left and then time flows to the right sometimes time flows uh, to, to the bottom of here's to the right uh, so you have a random initial state but then the the, the transitions is deterministic so the, they're random just in how you build the, the network the topology and the function but then let's say in the classical model these remain fixed um, so Starting from from an initial condition, after some time you uh, you, you start uh, repeating states. I mean, th these state spaces are huge; they are two to the n. But uh, sooner or later, uh, you will repeat a state because they are finite, and then you can say that you reach an attractor because instead of deterministic, it means that you, you will start repeating um, some of the states. So here you see that there's. Uh, series of states that don't repeat. So these are called the transients. And then once you start repeating cycle, this is called the attractor. Uh, and then it stays there unless it's perturbed. So uh, the, the attractors are the sets of the su subsets of states that uh, kind of capture the dynamics. And each attractor has a basin, which is the set of all states that lead to that attractor. Um, these are dissipative systems and deterministic in the sense that there's only one successor. Uh, so if you are in one state, the, these nodes now represent states. Uh, they all have one successor because it's deterministic. So if you are in one state, you know which will be your future. But if you are in the future, you don't know precisely where you came from. So for example, this one has several predecessors. Of course, you can calculate it, but uh, let's say there's lots of information that's that's why they're called dissipation dissipative systems and there are some states like 
uh, G, which are called Garden of Eden states that don't have predecessors, uh, meaning that you can reach them only from initial conditions. Uh, and these models are very, uh, very useful to study the relationship between the structure and function of systems. In this case, the topological uh, network and the state network. So the topological network would be this one, and we can call this the structure. It's like, okay, we have N elements and how these elements affect each other, how they are connected. So that's a network with N nodes, but then creates a state network, uh, which is this one. And this has, uh, let's say the topological network has the nodes of one bit. And the state network um, has two to the N nodes, and each node has N bits. So it's all possible combinations of the states uh, of the stru uh, structural network, or uh, and then you just build exhaustively uh, to, to construct the state network. Of course, in many cases, you can't uh, explore exhaustively these uh, search spaces. I mean, so, because to, to, to the, uh, well, if, if you want to, 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 to the 100, it's already um, very difficult for a computer. So uh, this, these are random neural networks and they have been studied thoroughly the last 50 years. And, uh, we can describe them as self-organizing uh, in the sense that the dynamics self-organize towards attractors. And this can be useful to understand how the interaction between the nodes, which could be seen as a lower scale or the, or the structural scale, will affect the network dynamics and properties, uh, which could be seen as a higher scale or the, the dynamical scale or the functional scale. Um, so, um, Kaufman in the 1990s uh, published a couple of books, The Origin So Further, and a more popular version at home in the universe. Uh, and I think the Human Genome Project had already begun, but wasn't finished, if, if I'm not mistaken. It wasn't finished for sure, but I think it, it already had begun. Uh, and if not, it was already about to start. And um, uh, back in that day, the, there was the estimate that humans, that, that we humans had about uh, 100,000 genes, and still there were only uh, about 300 cell types. So Kaufman had the idea already since 69 that the attractors of random neural networks, let's say of genetic regulatory networks, determine cell types. Uh, and this was following the idea of Waddington that you have an epigenetic landscape. That, and now, of course, it's much uh, better understood that you have stem cells and this, these stem cells uh, differentiate into stem cells of different lineages. And then from this, you will have skin and bone and cardiac tissue and uh, nervous systems and all, all of the, uh, let's say about 300 cell types that we have, different species have. Uh, different numbers of genes and so on. Um, so, if, if you have, uh, well, later it was, uh, you know, crisis and the evaluation that uh, we humans had about 30,000 genes, or I, I think now it's less than 26,000 genes. I, I saw some people suspecting that it was le less than 20,000 genes in humans. Um, well, but, but it doesn't matter. I mean, two to the 20,000 is a huge number. There's no time in the universe to explore all, all the combinations of genes on and off. Um, so this complexity reduction cannot be achieved by any genetic regulatory network. So it, it requires certain characteristic. So um, and let's say more things have been discovered since then uh, there's no there seems to be no correlation between the number of genes or let's say the complexity of genes and the complexity of the organisms because you you have 
plants and other uh, uh, organisms that have much more genes than humans, uh, but then they they're not necessarily more complex. And of course, they suggest that the number of genes uh, um, can have different meanings. Um, and we'll see about this now. Uh, because you can have several repetitions of the same gene or similar genes, and this will give you uh, robustness via redundancy or degeneracy. But we'll, we'll see more about this in a, in a moment. So the, the question um, that we want to address is uh, in which ways the self-organization of random Boolean networks can be guided either by us, um, let's say to explore the space of possible uh, dynamics or by evolution to evolve uh, dif uh, different organisms or genetic regulatory networks. So, um, it was found already by Kaufman that you have three different re dynamical regimes in these models, so order, chaotic, and critical. Uh, soon after, this was better studied by, by different people. Um, the Rida and Pomo in, in the, I think it was 84, they found an analytical solution for, for this. Um, so, so there's a phase transition. So basically, in the order, phase or in order regime, most nodes are static and you have robustness in the sense that you have convergence of similar states. So you, you can see here that very quickly it tends to an attractor and then there's no change. And if you would make a perturbation on, uh, on, on this attractor state, very probably you would go back to the same attractor. So it's, it's very robust. And then there's the chaotic regime where most nodes are changing, and this is fragile uh, because uh, you have divergence of similar states, meaning that if you start from very similar initial conditions, uh, you will probably diverge into different attractors. Or if you are already in an attractor and you make a small mutation, this will take you very far from, from that attractor. Um, But then there's a balance between these two extremes in the critical regime. Uh, some nodes are static and some are changing and this change spread locally. And uh, the, this balance between, let's say the properties of the order and the chaotic regime uh, maximizes information storage and coherent transformation, uh, information transfer and efficient information. And uh, Langton, uh, Chris Langton, who, who coined the term artificial life and organized the first workshops in Santa Fe, um, pr proposed this and uh, well, Kaufman told me that he, he heard it from, from Langton and he told like, well, yes, this, this same idea that I'm working with. But at the end, it seems Kaufman kind of got more credit for it, even when Kaufman gives credit to Langton. But uh, I mean, from the early 90s, there uh, several work from different people that speak about this age of chaos or criticality um, where you have let's say, the benefits uh, and avoid the drawbacks of, of both regimes, order and chaotic. So um, let's say for, for living systems and also for computing systems, you want some stability, you want to order, you want to preserve information. So that's in the order phase. But if you are only in the order phase, you cannot change that. You, you cannot adapt. Um, so in the chaotic phase, you can adapt, you can change, but then you lose all the information. You cannot keep what you already found. Uh, so, so that's not good for life and it's not good for computation. Um, so the, the hypothesis was that life could occur only at criticality. Uh, and there, well, the literature on criticality is much broader. So there, there has been much found about criticality. Um, there's this idea of self organized criticality by Perbach and others. Um, well, the, the, let's say that, that's another debate which I just mentioned, but let's say that we don't have time to go into, into it today. Um, then it, it turned out that. Um, Already this entry, data uh, began to be collected about real genetic regulatory networks. 
because when Kaufman told this, there was no data, and, and it, many people say, well, yeah, it makes sense, but uh, let's say, how do we know that real genetic regulatory networks are like that? We'll have data. So years later, okay, there is enough data, and they found evidence from four kingdoms that um, real genetic regulatory networks were not precisely critical, but they were on the other face close to critical, which actually, uh, well, I'm advancing to, to next week's uh, class. That suggests rather than being critical that they're anti-fragile, uh, but let's say the, the argument, I mean, anti-fragility is still not a very well-defined concept. So the idea is that they are critical or close to critical. Uh, and this gives us a balance between robustness, information storage, variability, computation, and exploration. And so we can say that this critical regime is desired for all of these reasons. So we can ask ourselves, how can we guide the self-organization of random boolean networks towards criticality? Uh, either we as humans or evolution, <coughs> uh, what, what tools are at hand or what properties uh, of, of genetic regulatory networks can be changed to reach criticality? Uh, and I mean, the same applies if we don't want criticality, but we want order dynamics or chaotic dynamics, uh, we can use the same knowledge to, to guide the self-organization of, of dynamical systems towards a desired dynamical regime. So we can exploit these factors that determine the criticality of, of random neural networks to guide the self-organization. So the first, the first two of these are the parameters P and K. Uh, this was already, uh, as I mentioned, this work of the Redan Pomo from 86. Uh, so so they, they analytically found the phase transition and this P is the probability that in the lookup table you will have a one. So if P equals one, you will have only ones. And then let's say it doesn't matter what's your initial states, you will go to a state of one. And the opposite, if it's zero, you will have only zeros and you will go to a state of zero. So that's why this curve is symmetric. Here, the P goes from zero to one. And at P equals 0.5, there's no bias in the lookup table, meaning that you have the same probability of having ones and zeros. And this gives you a critical connectivity, the K of two. So if there's no bias, when K equals two, you have criticality. Um, <clears throat> and this is, because if you have more than two uh, um, mutation or pro perturbation uh, will propagate on average to more than one node. So this will percolate through all the network and a small change will end up changing most of the network. And if it's less than two, on average, each perturbation will um, affect less than one other node. So this will kind of die out. So when it's exactly two, you will kind of um, uh, have this change, but it will not neither explode nor uh, disappear. Yeah, so, so, so that's the idea of criticality. But then if P increases or decreases, or let's say if it deviates, it's from 0.5, then the critical K increases uh, because you need more connectivity to achieve the same probability of one change spreading through all the network and then to fall into the chaotic phase. Then uh, there's this idea of canalizing functions. So uh, one definition of canalizing function is when at least one of the inputs uh, determines the, the output of the function. So for example, here in principle, we have two inputs, but in practice, the output just depends on one of the inputs. So in practice, you just have one input. Uh, so this is a canalizing function. And um, canalizing functions allow you to have higher K 
and still be critical, for example, or still be ordered because, um, yeah. So if you if you have a change in Y uh, in this input, this will not affect the, the output. So if you have more canalization, then the critical connectivity will increase. Then, uh, so that the topology uh, is, is very relevant. Actually, the, we can speak about structural heterogeneity. So the, well, still nowadays, many studies, well, yeah, most studies of random neural networks use homogeneous topologies um, or, no, or at least normal topologies, meaning that either all of the nodes have the same, exactly the same number of inputs or uh, on average, the similar number of inputs. Oops, sorry, just a moment. Okay, so <clears throat> these, these so-called uniform rank distributions or heterogeneous, uh, sorry, homogeneous uh, topologies um, will give you more and longer attractors and less correlation in expression patterns. And you can have skewed topologies, uh, meaning that you have one node with lots of connections and most nodes with very few connections. But on average, you, you can have the same number of connections. Uh, and this will give you less and shorter attractors and more correlations. Uh, and a balance between these two extremes is achieved with scale free topologies. So, Max Aldana, almost 20 years ago, studied okay, what are the properties of random neural networks with scale free topologies. And um, he, he found out that you, you achieve critical uh, dynamics. But for average connectivities, that would be assumed to be uh, in the order regime. Mm -hmm. Since you have few nodes that have lots of connections, then these nodes can propagate change. So that gives you, let's say, change. But then if you have change in most of the other nodes, uh, that will not propagate through the network. So that gives you at the same time robustness. Um, so, so you have at the same time uh, adaptability and robustness. So we, we could say that the scale-free topology expands the range of the critical regime towards the order phase. And then uh, modularity is another property which is prevalent in natural systems. Um, so Herbert Simon in, in his book, The Sciences of the Artificial, uh, gives an example of two clock makers that, uh, or and Tempus, well, I, I don't remember the names, but anyway, uh, one clockmaker uh, makes modules. So assume that they, they're making watches of 1,000 pieces each, and one makes models of 10 pieces. Uh, and then once he has uh, or she has models of uh, 10 pieces, you have 100. 100 uh, pieces, and that's a higher scale model. And when you have models of 100 pieces, then you already assemble the clock. And there's a 100 uh, pieces that you're working with will break down. So the, the other clock maker doesn't make models, so they start adding like sequentially, and with that probability of mutation, or, or let's say the, that what you're working on breaks down, you will never finish uh, building a clock uh, of 1,000 pieces. Uh, and, uh, uh, and the other one manages because, uh, let's say, sooner or later, the mutation will come, but at most, uh, it takes her back only the steps. So, um, let's say, many people have argued about the benefits of modularity. Uh, and it has been argued that promotes at the same time robustness and evolvability because the damage <coughs> within one module usually does not propagate through the whole system. So that's robustness. But then 
the useful changes that have been found can be exploited to find new configurations. This will not affect necessarily the functionality of other modules. So, uh, I mean, it is known that genetic regulatory networks are modular. So with a master student, we, we studied what happens when you have modular and modular networks. And we found that um, these modular networks uh, extend the critical regime, but now towards the chaotic phase, meaning that you can have an average connectivity that would uh, suggest that you are in the chaotic phase, but because of modularity, the perturbations do not spread through all the network, they stay within a module, and then you can have uh, critical dynamics. Uh, and then in another study with, with Stuart Kaufman and Ilyash Mulevich, we, we studied what's the effect of redundancy in, in the dynamics of random Mullah networks. So redundancy is simply having more than one copy of, of an element type. And we found that redundancy of nodes prevents mutations from propagating in, in these networks. Um, because basically, if you have one, uh, let's say you have two copies of the same node and then there's something that goes wrong with this one then this can function uh, as a standby and um, preserve the functionality in yeah however if the perturbation comes in you know, a node that affects these two then these two will also change and then that will not uh, prevent the the system from um, uh, so the the perturbation from affecting the whole system. So it, it, it helps uh, more sort of fitness landscape, totality. Um, but let's say it's not preventing all possible limitations. Uh, and then with, with another master student, we study the effect of the generacy and the generalized ability of elements are different to perform the same function. So, uh, for example, the generacy in public transportation is when you can go from one place to another through different routes or through different systems. So you can reach the university campus via metro or metro bus or bike biking or by car. Uh, so if one of these systems, for whatever reason, breaks down, either uh, there's a demonstration or traffic or whatever, then you can take another system to, to reach your destination. So that, that is an example of the generacy. Um, uh, redundancy would be like to have several streets that reach the same place. And then if one street uh, is blocked, you can take another one. But let's say if there's no fuel or I don't know, something happens with all the streets, then let's say you, you, you can't do much. So the generacy is also widespread in biological systems and can also uh, promote robustness and evolvability. And what we found in the generacy in random networks is that they complement, uh, they have a similar effect to redundancy in promoting robustness, but in a different way. So it, it, what I just said is that when you have redundancy, if you have two elements and this one fails, then this one can take um, its place. But then if the inputs change, then both of them will fail. And when, when you have the generacy, let's say you have elements that are not exactly the same, but sometimes perform the same function. So sometimes this will fail and this will, will stand in. The other sometimes it, it, will, it will not be able to, to take on the same functionality. But the input of this one fails that the, uh, in some cases, it will not affect this one, so this will, will be able to, to continue the, the same functionality. So again, it's another property that manages to, to promote robustness. Um, and then there's also anti-fragility that we'll see next week because it's like a, a whole different subject and also more recent. Um, <laughs> and this talk is already for, from several years ago. So we can divide um, two categories of of methods of guiding self-organization towards criticality. One has to do more with functions, another with topology. So we can move the phase transition and this with uh, 
pk or canalizing functions. So if you are way in the order phase, you can move p towards 0.5 or increase k and or decrease the canalization if there's any. And if you are too chaotic, you can do the opposite and that will take you towards criticality. Uh, and then the, the properties that have to do with topology, actually they broaden the critical regime. Uh, with a scale-free topology, with modularity, with redundancy or degeneracy. Uh, and actually, we are working now with another, which seems to be much more powerful, which is uh, heterogeneity. Well, the topology is a type of, of heterogeneity, structural heterogeneity, but we are exploring also temporal heterogeneity. So it turns out that if some nodes change, or let's say of data state slower than others, uh, only that will also increase the, the region of critical dynamics. It, it will broaden that, that region. And we're trying to understand that. And there's another candidate that, I mean, we assume that it will also have a similar effect to, wisdom, to test it. Uh, and that will be with uh, heterogeneity in the distribution of peace of the biases. Um, so if you have um, heterogeneity in the functionality of the nodes, we hypothesize that that will also increase the, the criticality. Uh, it will broaden the critical re regime. So, uh, why should we strive for criticality? to give us a balance between adaptability, evolvability, and robustness. Um, and we already define adaptability as the ability of a system to produce advantages, changes in response to a state in its environment. Evolvability is one definition is ability of random variations to sometimes produce improvement. This can be seen as a particular type of adaptability at, let's say, a time scale between generations. Um, and then Wagner defined a uh, robust system as one that continues to function in the face of perturbations. And let's say it complements adaptability. And, and we'll see in the next class how, what's the relationship also between robustness and anti fragility. So it, it seems that uh, having, uh, let's say, adjusting the topology and the modularity have to do more with evolvability. And then the redundancy and the generation more with robustness. So let's say rather than only one of all these mechanisms, it seems that um, evolution has played with all of them and maybe more. Uh, so probably it makes sense. Uh, and, and we can also explore that knowledge for artificial systems. So of course, we don't know precisely which of all these mechanisms were used by evolution to guide the criticality of genetic regulatory networks. Uh, that's an open question. And uh, there are also uh, interesting questions about how to relate different methods. So for example, uh, what would be the effect of having scale-free modular topologies because scale-free enhances criticality towards uh, the order regime and modularity towards the chaotic regime. So what if you have them combined? Uh, do they add up or, or only one dominant? We don't know. Um, when should we prefer the generosity over redundancy or vice versa? Uh, what are the differences or advantages and disadvantages of reaching criticality with these different methods? Because, of course, you could say, well, they all reach criticality, but uh, which type of criticality is more desirable in different circumstances? It might be that, well, it seems to me that uh, since the methods that just move the phase transition, um, if, if you are dealing with non-stationary problems, very probably, uh, let's say, small changes will take you out of criticality. And if you broaden the critical regime with the other methods, then let's say very probably this will be more efficient. Also, not necessarily it will be easier. Uh, I mean, it, it seems that 
the methods that move the phase transition are easier and cheaper, but kind of um, less robust to, to, to put it in, in some way. Um, and also the, the question about the proper balance between evolvability and robustness. I, uh, I mean, this is still an open question, but uh, we'll be better prepared to answer it or to discuss it next week after we, we speak about anti-fragility. So just to conclude, we saw some methods and networks. Uh, these are useful for understanding natural systems, including artificial ones, because we can generate some of these aspects that I mean, we're dealing just with random networks, but if we are interested in the building, uh, I don't know, a computer network, how, what should be the topology to preserve the functionality? Which kind of functionality should we have? We want it to be robust, but we want it to be adaptable, but we don't want it to be too fragile because if, for example, one server goes down and all the network goes down, we don't want that, that would be fragile, but we want the system to be able to spread changes. So if, let's say, if one server goes down, we don't want the system not to respond to that. You would like the loads to be balanced uh, among the remaining servers. And uh, in social systems, we can also uh, apply these ideas. So for example, we know that if we have too many interactions, that will be too chaotic dynamics. Um, so we don't want that. So for example, in, in traffic, we try to limit the number of interactions between uh, vehicles. So of course it's much easier to control, for example, uh, trains that are a convoy going all together than if everyone has a different speed. Uh, so trying to make homogeneous behavior uh, in vehicles is, is useful. It, it reduces the chaos in the dynamics. Uh, same in, in pedestrian flows. Uh, so, so you try to restrict the, the, um, the interactions. So let's say when, when people design um, public spaces, uh, they should consider different interventions that kind of uh, limit the interactions in panic situations so that uh, to, to avoid uh, it's a tragedy where people get trampled and, and things like that. Um, in, I don't know, in political situations, you can also extrapolate some of, some of these uh, ideas um, or, or in, in international relations as well. Um, so some colleagues from Portugal, uh, they, they have been using game theory to study uh, evolutionary biology, but they have been more recently applying it to uh, climate change policies. Uh, and they realized that if you have groups that are very large, it's very difficult to reach a consensus. Like in the European Union, 25 members, it's too much, they, they will never reach an agreement. Unless, uh, let's say, there's an agreement by the big players, and then the small ones just follow those agreements. But then what they suggest is that there should be like agreements be made at um, mesoscopic scales, let's say three, five uh, actors, and then they reach an agreement. And then together they can go and reach agreement with an, at another scale with, with other group, which is uh, smaller. Because otherwise you, you will never reach an agreement if, if there are too many actors on, on the table. Um, and, and for example, there are systems that we would like to change, but they are way too robust, like corruption in Mexico is very robust. So how to, <laughs> so the, the, that is already like in the critical regime, but in order to change it, we need to take it and to make it more fragile so that it can change. Uh, so that's, uh, let's say, another place where these insights can be useful. Um, how, how can you uh, affect the interactions in such a way or the, or the structure so the function becomes less robust? <laughs> because now, basically, 
uh, you, you capture uh, a cartel leader and then it's like a hydra five more pop up <laughs> uh, uh, and, and you never finish so it's it's very robust so when you try to uh, fight the problem you make it worse because it, it is there's this positive feedback um, so so how can you change that so that it becomes more fragile and actually weakens this very robust phenomenon. Uh, so, so these are some of the real applications that these very abstract models can have. So let's say if we understand how guiding the self-organization of random neural networks works and how can we change, uh, uh, let's say, different properties of the systems, then this can give us ideas of interventions to affect real systems, real complex systems, either to take them to criticality <laughs> or to take them from criticality to a region where there is easier to change or easier to destroy. Um, yeah, so the, there's plenty of, of things to ask. So uh, you, you can find more in this, in this paper. Uh, which is already published in theory in bio biosciences. Um, oh, 10 years, <laughs> time flies. Um, are there any questions? You can raise your hand or in the chat. Well, no, I have done that question. But I need to read more this this article complete. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, oh, sorry. Yeah, I'll, I'll put the the link to the article in the in the Google Classroom. Can you share the paper about uh, about um, climate policies? Yeah. Please, thank yeah. you. Um, Roberto writes, is there such thing as stochastic NK models? Uh, yes, uh, actually, um, well, I, I, I did my master's in evolutionary analytics systems at Sussex University. And there uh, I took the course of artificial life within Man Harvey. So, it was in that course that I learned about random Euler networks. And uh, he, with Terry Bosomeyer from Australia, criticized um, Kaufman because they say, well, genes, well, in the, in the classical Kaufman model, uh, there is, um, the, the update is synchronous, meaning that uh, just like in the game of life, you check the state of all nodes and then you kind of update each node but considering the current state and once you update all of this then you kind of copy them uh so um so, so you have like two sets of states t and t plus one and you update t plus one with t and once you finish updating then uh you move t plus one to t and then you uh, go to the next step uh and uh inman and terry we're saying that uh, this is not realistic because genes don't march in step. There's no central clock to synchronize them. So, the, the, well, this is called synchronous updating. So they they split what happens when uh, random Euler networks have a synchronous updating. So their synchronous updating is like, well, we just pick a node at random and then update it. And then we pick another node at random and then update it. And then we pick another node and then update it. And it may be the, that you are updating the same node several times before you update another node other times. And what they found is that um, you lose cyclic attractors because, but not because of the asynchronicity, but because they also lost the determinism. So answering Heriberto, these are models that are stochastic. Uh, so basically, you, you flip a coin every time step to see which uh, node you will update. But then since um, you can update one or the other from the state from the same state, you can go to different states. So these systems are no longer dissipative. 
uh, and there there is non determinacy. And when I listened to, to this, I, I thought, well, okay, I agree that uh, real genetic robot networks are not uh, synchronous, but I don't think that they are random either. So I proposed an updating, well, uh, an updating scheme that it's asynchronous, but deterministic. So basically you add a period and a phase for each node. And this basically tells us different nodes to update at different rates. Uh, and this gives you asynchronous updating, but in a deterministic way. So again, these systems are deterministic. And again, you have cyclic attractors. And these are much similar to synchronous updating than, than the asynchronous non-deterministic. And then I, I also propose a classification to relate all of these updating schemes. And um, so the, let's say the bottom line is that the difference between the model of Harvey and Bosomeyer and Kaufman is more much more to do because of the randomness rather than the uh, asynchronicity. And uh, you can also encode asynchronicity in synchronous Ranbula networks. And, um, but yeah, they, they haven't been very well studied because you don't have cyclic attractors, but you do have something called loose attractors in the sense that the dynamics does not, uh, I mean, you still have garden of hidden states and the point attractors, they are the same independent of the updating scheme. But in loose attractors, you remain in a subset of the state space and you don't have a fixed trajectory within that subset, but you never go out of that subset. Uh, and these loose attractors haven't been studied. So that's a, a potential project if for, for, for could be like a master's project if anyone's interested. Um, okay. Uh, Jack asks if, if there's a is there a subcategorization of criticality? Um, perhaps, but I'm not aware of it. Uh, I mean, there, there is much work uh, in in physics about criticality um, that is related to phase transitions and non-equilibrium systems. But I, yeah, I wouldn't be able to to say what would be the subcategorization in, in sense like different subdynamical regimes. I, I don't understand the question. Uh, Amari asks, what are, are your thoughts about the critical brain hypothesis? Well, there is, yeah, the, uh, there is some evidence that some brain dynamics are critical or that brain is also at criticality um, in the sense that, uh, well, the, the, the question is also how you measure criticality. That's uh, that's another question, but um, the idea is that in the brain, you also need this balance between robustness and stability. Um, also, there is some evidence that some brain dynamics are chaotic. Um, and it also, also depends not only on the dynamics themselves, but on what are the interactions with the environment. So for example, in hot field networks, it is known that if you have some noise, then they classify better. Um, but of course, if you have too much noise, uh, then uh, let's say they, they, they don't classify anything at all if you put too much noise. Uh, and it, it seems that this has to do with anti-fragility. So, so next week we'll, we'll see more about that. Yes, yeah, so, so next week we'll see more about robustness and anti-fragility. And on Thursday, there will be a guest lecture by Poloka about crowdsourcing. Um, okay, and then Heriberto asks, are there models with weighted NSORG or case? Um, if you mean weights like with neural networks, I don't think so, but I think you can use, yeah, uh, Ilyash Mulevich and others have made another generalization of random Boolean networks, which are called probabilistic Boolean networks, uh, PDNs. Uh, and these were 
proposed because when people start getting data about real genetic regulatory networks, in some cases you didn't have full information. So you you have you start constructing your network, and then there are some links, and you don't know whether there's a link or not. So you they say, well, let's just put a probability, and <laughs> uh, and let's say that's like a variation of the original model. And with those probabilistic bullet networks, you can make a classification. So um, Pedro Rivera, who's a, a postdoc with me now at the, at the C3, he, he has worked with those. And uh, uh, we submitted already some time ago a, a paper using probabilistic bullet networks uh, to, to model electric grids. Um, OK, so. There are more questions in the chat. Lucrecia asks, uh, I'm not clear about two things. The self-organization arise at the age of chaos. Uh, not necessarily, because a very general definition of self-organization is just, uh, let's say, applied specifically to random Boolean networks is, um, RBNs tend to their attractor, which is most probable state. Uh, and this transition is what you're interested in. So that doesn't happen only at the edge of chaos. It happens ev everywhere uh, in, in all three dynamical regimes. Uh, I mean, they, they self-organize towards an attractor, either ordered, and that will be very quickly, or they self-organize to a chaotic attractor, and maybe they will never reach that att attractor because, let's say, will take forever. Uh, and let's say a characteristic of, of chaos in random Boolean networks is that either the attractors are very long or you are falling for an absurdly long time before you reach an attractor. Um, so that's why you see noise and you don't see any repeating patterns. And then, um, an attractor is the final state of the system. So the attractors set the self organizing options of the system. Uh, no, no. Uh, you could say that it self organizes faster in the order regime and much slower in the uh, chaotic regime. Because also, you can say that organization is the opposite of entropy in the sense that entropy can be seen as disorder. So then, order organization are similar. So then the most organized networks would be those without dynamics. So let's say like with a bias, a P equals one or zero, doesn't matter what's your initial state, you will go to your attractor in the next state and it will be all ones or all zeros. Uh, and that's like maximum self-organization. But of course it's not very useful because there's no dynamic. Um, And Odin shared the paper by Heike Sever of doing patterns using random brand networks. Thanks. Okay. Are there any, any other questions? Or in, in the slides, there, there's more references. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, and another important thing, next Thursday, this channel will be busy. So uh, be sure to, to check on the, on the Google Classroom, uh, the de details for another Zoom connect connection just for next Thursday. Uh, well, we'll use it also in couple of other dates that, that this channel will be busy, but um, the first one will be next Thursday. Okay. Um, and also start thinking about your final project what would you like to work on? Because uh, soon you will present your ideas about what would be that final project, and uh, let's say we'll give you, we'll give you feedback here. 
Okay. So ha have a great Tuesday. Thank you.